okay uh, all right uh, i believe like we are all set to go for the session and uh, hi everyone and this is shrija i'm working as a community manager with dc cap and first of all i would like to thank you so much for registering to the magento masters virtual series and dc cap has been actively organizing magento meetups in chennai for more than 5 years uh, however during the lockdown that has affected at least the quarter of the world's population uh we are looking for some means to organize the meetup so I, our idea was to open magento masters and ask them to share their insights with people across the globe through the virtual meetup so our first virtual meetup happened a month ago and uh, it was indeed a great success almost 120 people turned up so that success made us think why not facilitate such meetup uh, frequently so here we are magento masters virtual series uh, a bi weekly event especially for magento community across the industry this is our third webinar in this series so all that said and i don't want to hold off you guys from hearing out the captivating sessions by the wonderful speakers lined up for this evening i'm sure that you all will have a great learning experience tonight uh, let me call jennifer to introduce the speakers thank you thank you shrija thanks for taking over so Hello guys so I'm the host for the uh, for the day and this is the third uh, virtual series like Shrija quoted so we're really happy about and happy and looking forward to a lot of uh, sessions from the Magento masters themselves so let's uh, not uh, without further ado let, let me just uh, go ahead and introduce to you TJ Gamble so he is the founder and CEO of uh, Jameson and he is the personality behind e-commerce aholic a content brand that produces uh, educational content for the e-commerce community So uh, TJ has uniquely positioned himself as a thought leader in the industry due to the mass appeal to the wide array of uh, community members. So this e-commerce holic uh, delivers meaningful content to the up and coming small merchant, large enterprise and uh, technical uh, audience like. This company Jameson works with uh, merchants to help them achieve their growth goals uh, through data analysis and uh, store optimization. uh we really like to hear a lot from you uh tj campbell so over to you awesome well i appreciate you having me this morning morning for me i'm sure it's evening for a lot of you out there um i don't have anything really formal planned for this conversation i really wanted to be more of just just a conversation so we're going to talk about headless e-commerce a little bit um i'll talk about why You know, I think it's a little bit overblown, a little bit overhyped, but at the same time, the future of our industry, e-commerce, the future of the web in general. And I see we've got attendees starting to roll in here. I appreciate all of you showing up for this, um, and we're going to have a Q and A at the end. Um, they've given me ten minutes for Q and A. I may extend that a little bit. I think it's more important to get your questions answered and make sure we give you as much value. as we can and um you know answer any questions you have definitely a few names i recognize in the chat there uh, muliadi jo in the chat thanks for joining muliadi i still i'm still coming to visit you at some point and staying in your extra house you have there um so let me pour myself just a little bit of a drink here it's a little early in the morning it's a little early in the morning but you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning i've got some good jefferson's ocean bourbon there and get the conversation going right hopefully if you're stuck in quarantine like everybody stuck in quarantine uh you maybe you've got a little comfort there yourself so let's let's talk about headless uh and for those that don't know I'm going to start with the basic definition of headless headless is where basically the the logic the business logic the behind the scenes logic of your website is separated from the front end presentation layer of your website. So, uh in e-commerce, the front end of the website where someone interacts with it, you know, in their browser and they actually add it to their cart and they do all their checkout, you know, everything they interact with is completely separated from the actual e-commerce engine. And they tie those together through APIs typically, but they could be tied together through any number of things. Like we we think of modern technology with javascript on the front end and graphql apis and then back in logic but that's not necessarily headless 
Um, headless just means they're decoupled, they're separated. And so you can do that through any number of technologies. And there's a few different ways people go about doing this. Um, and lots of times you'll see people use like a middleware layer. So uh, a lot of these popular um, PWA front ends will use like Elasticsearch to kind of, you know, standardize their interactions from the PWA. And then the Elasticsearch integration handles most of the heavy lifting in the back end. And we'll, we'll talk about that particular architecture in, in just a little bit. But, you know, most people think with headless, nowadays you think PWA, progressive web apps. And, you know, just, just to make sure we define everything for those that maybe don't understand what that is, a progressive web app is essentially a JavaScript application that lives in the browser of your user. So it, it kind of puts a lot of that processing power for the front end in the browser rather than it being server rendered and put out. Um, it puts it in the browser. And then that JavaScript application um, has some advantages over a traditionally, traditionally themed website. And again, we'll, we'll kind of go over those, but I'm just trying to get through the definitions here at the, at the beginning. So you've got a PWA that communicates through APIs to the e-commerce engine. But again, that's not necessarily the case. I would say the vast majority of websites right now that are headless are actually not PWAs. And an example of this is what Big Commerce did with their WordPress integration. You've got Big Commerce on the back end and all of that data is pulled over to WordPress. And as you go through and check out, that is sent via API back to Big Commerce. And so it's not PWA, it's just traditional WordPress, PHP, HTML, CSS front end, but that is technically a headless implementation. Uh, and so let's, let's talk about why this is a bit overblown. And then we'll talk about why I also think it's still the future. Um, but, you know, and then we'll get into kind of the, the technical details of, of some of the different implementations. Um, I, I think it's overblown in that a lot of people, businesses in particular, um, and, and it's usually because folks like myself go out there and hype these technologies. You know, we're selling technology. We're trying to get people to buy a new website. We're trying to get them to be excited about something. So we hype some new technology as the savior, right? This technology is going to make you more money. This technology is going to fix your business that's sliding into debt. Um, you know, this, this is new and it's fresh and it's gonna, you know, it's not the field of dreams. This is not, you're not Kevin Costner. It's not if you build it, they will come, right? Like you have to have a strategy to grow your business. And a lot of people confuse technology with strategy. And they think just because they have the latest and greatest technology that their business is actually going to uh, improve from it. I mean, I, I fall into that trap sometimes with this studio. I've got the latest and greatest cameras. We built a fancy backdrop. I've got huge you know, microphones and streaming rigs and expensive lights. But if I don't know what to do with all of this technology, I don't get any benefit from it. If we don't know how to set it up so I can use it for a live stream and then I go live stream, then I get no benefit. If we don't create videos and put it out, we don't get benefit. And it's the same thing for businesses looking to improve their e-commerce. They get enamored with shiny objects, you know, fancy things, new technology, but PWA is not going to save your business. It can be a part of a strategy to improve your business, but it alone is not going to bring you a bunch more sales. With that said though, why I think it's actually the future is because of the potential it provides. And right now we're not reaching any of that potential. Um, most of the time, if I see a PWA right now, it is pretty much just like a traditional theme. You couldn't even tell it's a PWA. Like you, you, Jamerson.com, J-A-M-E-R-S-A-N.com, that's a PWA. That's a Gatsby JavaScript progressive web app with a WordPress back end. But it, it's just a fast version of a traditional looking theme. We're not doing anything really crazy 
that's going to test the limits and capabilities. Uh, we haven't got to a point to where our thinking about the possibilities of PWA can actually over, you know, overcome kind of the, the you know, thoughts we've had in the past around traditional things. You know, we've, we've ingrained what a website should be into our mind because we've been doing it one way for about 20 years. And so it's gonna take a little while before we understand that some of those limitations have been lifted. Like some of the things we could not do with traditional theming can now be done with progressive web apps, but that's expensive to do. And so you have to really understand the value of that functionality to create it, or you have to wait for the tooling. And so, you know, the tooling is not there yet for progressive web apps. You can build a basic PWA and, you know, almost functional parity with a traditional theme right now, especially in Magento with PWA Studio or one of the third party libraries, Deity, View Storefront, whichever is your favorite, doesn't matter to me. You could build a website that's very similar to a traditionally themed website. It could be done. But if you want to go beyond that, if you want to test some of the you know, boundaries of progressive web apps, you pretty much need to write that yourself and then it becomes very expensive. But as more people understand that functionality, as more sites are architected to utilize that functionality, then we're going to see an increase in libraries and modules and some of these off the shelf PWA uh, setups tech stacks supporting those things. You know, if you want to use the camera to scan something or have somebody take a photo and upload it directly into, you know, your, your flow, um, which, you know, we're talking to some merchants, I've got them listed on the board over here, uh, that, that need that kind of functionality. Maybe they're in a, you know, highly regulated industry and they need to scan the back of a driver's license in the United States to, you know, get that information to have you register. Well, that's a PWA feature that would be difficult to do in a traditional environment to, to actually barcode scan. You might could figure out, but you're going to figure it out with some PWA like JavaScript functionality. And so, you know, with that, it's really expensive. But as more and more people use PWAs, then, you know, those boundaries are a lot further out than traditional theming. We can go a lot further. We can do a lot more things. We can build better customer experiences. Right now, all we're focused on is, oh, we can do exactly what we were doing and it's faster. And that, you know, is it worth the effort and the risk that comes with PWA to just be faster? And it depends on, I guess it depends on how much faster or how important that is to your business. But, you know, that's only scratching the surface of what a progressive web app can do. And so if you're only thinking of faster and not of better user experience, then you, you kind of, you know, you're missing the point just a little bit with progressive web apps. Uh, and so, you know, it's not until we have maybe some experiences and, and we push the limits a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and we get further and further down that road that we'll truly understand how powerful JavaScript-based progressive web apps can be. Um, and, and it, you know, they come with some headache too. Like there, there is, you know, some, some problems with um, early adoption of any technology, not just progressive web apps, any technology. There's functionality right now you're going to have to leave behind. There's things that the off-the-shelf PWAs just won't do that you may have to either write yourself, which can be costly, or um, you may just, you know, have to have to do it some other way. Um, that'll, that'll eventually change. You know, eventually Magento's PWA Studio will have functional parity with um, the traditional theme and, you know, base Magento. Um, there's, you know, there's going to be third-party uh, PWA themes that go way beyond what Magento's uh, PWA studio will do. And so eventually we'll be there. But for now, there are problems with going that route. Uh, and early adopters, pioneers always, you know, kind of suffer those wounds. Um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, like, for instance, SEO in a JavaScript application is still a bit shaky. Like it's still a bit, you know, how does Google pick it up? 
you know, how to, you know, are they actually understanding my pages? Are they seeing all my pages? There's some complexities there. It's different than a traditional HTML site where it just pulls all the data and it shows you. Um, so it's, you know, you've, you've got to worry about those things. You've got to figure out hosting. Hosting's different. Now you've got this standalone JavaScript application you have to deal with. Well, is that, you know, embedded into the front end of your Magento site and all hosted on one server? Is that hosted on a different server? Well, if it's hosted on a different server, now, you know, how does, how do those things interact? Um, if it's on a user's browser, you've got to, you know, figure out, well, how is the network transfer back and forth to get the data that we need? Um, you know, can, can it handle being offline? Uh, you know, what's the purpose in having an e-commerce website that's offline? I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, you've got a customer that has some, some use case where they need to be offline for a while and come back online and then place their order. Um, you know, how, how does it handle all of that? So there, there is a lot of pitfalls around progressive web apps and early adoption, but the potential is huge, um, you know, to have super fast sites with, you know, lazy loading all of the data and loading everything in the background, super efficient data transfer once all of that's worked out uh, and, you know, everything's functionally par, you know, on par with, um, with traditional things. Uh, you, you've got just incredible potential to take user experiences to that next level. Um, you know, interaction with the hardware. Like you can do stuff on PWA that you could previously only do on a mobile, a native mobile app. And native mobile apps are problematic because with the native mobile apps, well, now I've got to manage a website, I've got to manage an Android app, and I've got to manage an iPhone app. And so that's just a whole lot more technical debt and overhead, and I can replace all of that with just my website. Uh, and so, you know, that, that type of capability, that type of performance and user experience. And I really think when we're architecting out all of these progressive web apps, we really need to be thinking about architecting them more like a native mobile app rather than a website uh, and start to understand, you know, the real possibilities that, that come with all of that. Um, so let's see how far I'm just checking the time here um, just to make sure. So it looks like we've got about 12 minutes. So let's, let's go into the, um, the architecture differences a little bit of, of how some people are architecting out these systems and, and why I think, you know, some of those are good. Some of those are bad. Uh, and it, it really depends on your objectives and your goals as to which one of these is the best route. There are benefits and detriments to both. Um, you know, one, I, I think Magento, everybody now understands that, that headless is important. And I think headless is going to change the landscape of platforms, especially e-commerce platforms, but content management platforms in general. Um, really big organizations these days are doing pretty much what's called microservices, right? Where you've got small services that are maybe best of breed for what they do. They do one specific little thing or a little specific set of things. And you, you know, you integrate all of those into a coherent front end. Well, PWA is going to bring that to the masses a little bit in that your e-commerce platform doesn't also have to have content management. It, you know, you, you traditionally, if you're going to integrate WordPress with Magento, that can be kind of problematic. Like Fishpig had a module for Magento one that did that, but it, it was a bit of a mess. Like it, it worked, but it, it came with a lot of problems. Now, well, you, your front end is a standalone application. And so with it being a standalone application, you could just plug in all sorts of different modules. You're not reliant upon the theming of your e-com platform for the presentation layer. So now through APIs, we can get our content from WordPress and our e-commerce from Magento. And, and the concern with that though, is that once we get to that point, do, does that lessen the benefits of an open source platform versus a SaaS platform? And I would say a little bit, but not completely. In that once our presentation layer is completely separated from the back end uh, coding, 
then you could do anything you want to do on the front end of that website, regardless of whether or not your back end e commerce engine is SaaS or open source. So, any front end benefits that Magento has are completely negated, they're gone. Like, there is no front end benefit, no presentation layer benefit to Magento at that point versus any of the SaaS offerings. And then you're also moving people's, you know, how they think about architecting out of site into a microservices type of architecture. We already have two systems at play. We already have JavaScript on the front end and it's its own standalone application and an e-commerce engine. And so with that, you know, the way you would architect out something complicated on SaaS versus Magento, like with Magento, it's open source. So you've got it all here and you just pile your custom modules on top of it and you've still got one big system. With open source, or excuse me, with SaaS, you have a SaaS platform and you can't really add any code. It's got APIs. And so you have to build a standalone third-party application to do heavy customization. And so now you've got two systems. My argument these days is, is if I have to build my own tech stack and I have to pick something like Laravel or you know PHP or whatever I'm gonna write it in, and I'm going to build an application and I have to maintain and update and patch that application, then I have lost all benefits of SaaS. Whereas I, you know, so I have a standalone application. But if we move to this microservices model, then you're gonna be using a lot of different systems anyway. Uh, and so for, a, I think for a lot more merchants, not for everybody, but for a lot more merchants and for a lot more developers, they're gonna be thinking about terms, you know, like microservices and how to architect out. And then having a e-com platform and your own little custom microservice, especially if you've got four or five different services you're using, having your own little custom one is not as, um, uh, obtrusive as it would be right now. Whereas, you know, with Magento, it's just one stack. So I think the days of having one big monolithic system are slowly starting to dwindle. And so we're going to have a bunch of smaller systems. And I think PWA is the key to that. I think that's the start to that. And I don't know how many years or decades it'll take to get there, but I think that's, that's kind of one of those, you know, key things. And so if you're, you know, if you're building this PWA and, you know, with Magento, they're build, they're way ahead. Magento is way ahead with PWA versus any other platform I deal with. Mostly Shopify, big commerce, you know, we're big commerce partners. We don't really do so much with Shopify, but I talk about it a lot in content. You know, we're always doing a lot of research on it. It's obviously a big player. And so Magento's way ahead in PWA. Their GraphQL coverage is fantastic. PWA Studio, they're the only ones building their own front end reference implementation. So if you want to build a PWA on BigCommerce or Shopify, okay, it's possible you're on your own. Go pick a front end. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. You get no support from the platform themselves. Uh, you, you're on your own to do the front end stuff. So they've, they've built the integrations, the capabilities for the most part. Um, you know, they've still got work to do there. But on the front end, you're on your own. Whereas Magento has built this whole reference in implementation with PWA Studio uh, and, and their PWA Studio theme. Um, so I feel like that gives them a huge leg up because theoretically in, you know, in a year or so, you know, I'm assuming a year, uh, maybe, maybe later this year, I don't know how, you know, the pandemic has slowed them down on their roadmap, but you will be able to set up Magento with a PWA theme out of the box and have exactly the same functionality as you would have setting it up with a traditional theme. And no other e-commerce platform can come close to that because every other platform is going to depend on a third party progressive web app. And there's some good in that, there's some bad in that. And I'll, you know, we'll talk about the good um, to start with. A, a third party PWA theme is great because they've thought out the PWA. They, they're not so concerned with supporting functionality that nobody may ever use in, you know, just to make sure you have functional parity. What they're worried about is building the best PWA experience they can build. 
And so a lot of these third party libraries can be way ahead just in user experience, polish, transitions, you know, lazy loading stuff. Like they get to spend all their effort and time on those things and not so much adding the wish list that nobody may use or, you know, some piece of functionality. Um, so they build that core functionality and they can go way further with it um, because they have a hyper focus. Now, the downside of a third party library is almost all of these third party libraries ultimately want to support multiple. They don't really usually just support Magento. They want somebody on Big Commerce to be able to use their implementation. They want somebody on Shopify to be able to use their implementation. Understandably so, because not everybody on Magento is going to pick them. And so, you know, it's a business. Even an open source initiative is a business. And so they want the biggest appeal possible. So what they have to do is that middleware implementation. And the problem with the middleware implementation is that you lose a lot of the benefit and uniqueness of the platform that you chose. And so it almost puts this kind of vanilla filter on top of the platform and you lose some of that benefit. And, and you know, if it's open source like Magento, there's gonna be pieces of functionality out of the box that they just don't support. Over time, there may be modules, you know, you can, and obviously with Magento, you can write it, but if you're writing code from scratch, things get expensive and, you know, it gets kind of, kind of crazy. And, you know, the more expensive things get, um, the harder it is for merchants to actually do that. Uh, and so, you know, you, you lose a little bit of the benefit, the, the purity of the platform you chose, but you get more options. Like, I mean, think about it. In theory, in theory, if I chose a third-party PWA thing, and I had my whole site implemented on it, and I didn't like my e-commerce platform for some reason. I would say I was on Shopify and it was just killing me. It was slow, it was terrible. I didn't want to use it anymore. Or I was on Magento and I just couldn't afford the cost to maintain it anymore and I wanted to move to a SaaS platform. Theoretically, I could go in the background and I could just redo that middleware layer. And there may be plugins where I can just unplug it and plug in uh, big commerce or Shopify or Magento to change my e-commerce platform in the back end. And overnight I can go from being on Magento to being on big commerce or from being on Shopify to being on Magento or whatever, or some other platform we've never heard of. So, it, you know, there's some, there's some benefits to that. Uh, and it's going to make it a lot easier if you use a third party theme to theoretically keep exactly the same website and move from platform to platform if you choose to do so. Um, you know, what are the ramifications of that? Not really sure. Uh, and I see we've got some, some questions in the chat. I'm gonna make sure we get to all of those with the QA. It looks like I'm coming up on about two minutes here um, before we're gonna get to the QA. It looks like I didn't extend it at all. I also didn't drink my Jefferson's Ocean, uh -huh. which is good stuff if you get a chance to try it. Um, so with that, let's, let's get around to the questions here. Um, I'm going to read some in, in the chat and if you have any questions, post them, let me know. Um, you know, we talk about anything, anything in general, you know, I, I don't know everything about everything, but I talk to a lot of folks. So if we've got a uh, particular question, even if it's not about headless, feel free to drop it in there and let me know. Um, so let's see just kind of reading through for the question. Um, all right. All right, so um, Gotham here asks, how easy is it going to be to convert, adapt an already developed Magento website to PWA? And is the cost going to be as huge as developing an entirely new website? Um, the question is yes and no, right? Like maybe, maybe not. It depends on a lot of factors. So if you've got an already built Magento site, you've got a few things working for you already. You've already got all your data into Magento. And so as long as you're already on Magento 2, say, um, then you don't have the cost of migrating the data and getting all that right and updating products and all of that stuff. So that instantly saves you some money versus 
just starting from another platform or from Magento one and having to move to Magento two to do it. Um, the theming, the, the development work, anytime you do something new, you're not going to be as efficient at it as you were at the thing you've done before a thousand times. Like most of our developers, you know, they were much slower on Magento two to start with than they were on Magento one. Now they're much more efficient at Magento 2, much faster at Magento 2 than they were at, at Magento 1, even though they've been doing Magento 1 for 10 years, most of them. And some of, you know, they've been doing Magento 2 for a few years. Uh, so, you know, I think PWA long term could potentially be a lot faster to implement on than a traditional thing. Um, and I think the tooling is going to grow beyond what the, the tooling was for Magento. Um, traditionally, if you picked a Magento theme, then you got whatever that theme offered, functionality-wise, or you customized it. With PWA, I see there being a whole marketplace for React apps or view components, React components, view components, things like that, that you'll be able to just buy off-the-shelf components and integrate them into your PWA. And so, you know, you will be able to buy front end components that work with Magento potentially out of the box, um, especially on the third party uh, PWA implementations. I almost assure you they'll have components that people will be able to go in there and purchase to speed up implementation. Right now, probably going to be about the same as starting over from a front end perspective, maybe a little harder depending on how much you've got to customize and how proficient you are with the you know the the choices you've made you know if you choose a react if you choose magento pwa studio how good are you at those technologies how fast can you overcome the problems that are going to arise because it's different uh, so yeah you know, it's it's going to be costly at this point and unless you have some inherent reason to go pwa unless you're trying to push the limits of what you could do with a traditional theme for a lot of merchants it's just not worth the cost and you know potential headache that comes with something new yet but it will be all right so we're going to continue down these questions here um let's see is it possible to have magento pwa for only mobile and access the normal magento theme website by desktop laptop uh theoretically you know theoretically it's possible to do that um what, what you would probably do then, though, really is the traditional way. Like, right before we had all this responsiveness, we, you know, you would have a mobile site, at least big, big organizations would have a mobile site and a desktop site. And if you hit it on a browser that's smaller than a certain width or whatever logic it's using, it would forward you to, like, m dot your domain or mobile dot your domain or something like that. You could probably do something like that, like have a standalone PWA that integrates with the APIs and then have a fully functioning Magento site set up. I, you know, you may have some problems with that with like PWA Studio. Um, you may wanna, you know, there may be some problems there because it, its front end presentation layer kind of owns Magento. And so, you know, I don't know if it's possible to have PWA Studio turned on and traditional thing. As a matter of fact, I think it's not at this point, maybe someday in the future. But if you were using a third party module, a third party PWA, then yes, I think you could absolutely just stand Magento up normally, serve that. And if you detect somebody's on mobile, flip them over to that PWA. Um, all right. So don't you think it'll actually cost more for the merchants in the long run, especially when they have to start using so many external microservices and combine them into one. Even right now, it actually adds up so fast the monthly cost when you start adding separate search solution, personalization engine, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, Muliata, it's gonna be more expensive. I mean, it's just, you know, now e-commerce is getting more and more enterprise for everybody. Like there are certain things that are table stakes that everybody has to have. Um, like a good search, Magento search is garbage. Like all, all of the e-commerce provider searches are not wonderful. That's the reason the third party search uh, exists. And I'm really surprised that, you know, somebody hasn't cannibalized their own ecosystem and, you know, taken over search. But that's a good example. Now you've got to pay for Magento or Big Commerce or Shopify, and then you got to go pay for a third party search provider, you know, three or four or $500 a month. But, you know, you do this 10 times, it gets crazy. But it doesn't have to be that much more expensive. 
like if you're using WordPress for your front end and Magento open source for your back end, well, you've got two hosting costs, but if you host them in the same place in subdomains or something like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be more expensive right now, but that's also why it's not going to be for everybody. Like doing the whole microservices is not going to be for everybody. I'm not saying every single merchant out there is going to have microservices, but more merchants after, you know, they go full PWA and they've had it for a while, will start to have the option or the potential to rely on the best of breed approach for whatever piece of functionality they, they need. And I think a lot of these microservices will develop as services intended to be microservices for a PWA. So search providers will build PWA functionality and they'll be their own microservice. And they, you know, they may feed data from Magento, but they're not tightly integrated in Magento. So it's just, you know, you same search provider you had, but they've architected their solution different to be a microservice to separate themselves so that when you decide to unplug that Magento and plug in a different one, Magento 3 comes out, you want to unplug Magento 2 and plug in Magento 3, their search doesn't change. You have an integration between them that changes, but their search doesn't change, right? Um, so that, I mean, that's already a bit of a microservice. Uh, it's just a microservice is tightly coupled into your front end right now, whereas it might be a little more loosely coupled. But yes, the cost for that to be more expensive, the potential's there, but as with everything, it co everything costs a lot more when it's new. And then as it gets older and we start to figure out ways, you know, Magento 2 implementations were a lot more expensive after Magento 2 first came out because we were figuring it out. Now they're, they're you know, starting to normalize and, and get down a little bit. So um, the potential's there, but I don't think it necessarily has to be. And I don't think everybody's going to be microservices. All right. So I, this is Gotham's question that I've already answered here. Um, all right. So Barath, thanks for the session. I'm working for a client whose traffic is really high. Most of the traffic's from mobile. Can I suggest PWA for the client? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that's, Again, depends, right? With that little bit of information, here's what, you know, the thought is, right? Like the possibility to be more mobile friendly is there. The possibility to build a better mobile user experience is there. But how is their site performing right now? If their site is doing really well in mobile and their conversion rates are high, then it's probably not worth the risk. If they're struggling with mobile and there's opportunity to capture more of the market, there's opportunity to get more sales by having a better mobile experience, then it's definitely something to consider. Um, high traffic, you know, that's one of those things where I haven't seen a super high e-commerce PWA on any of the platforms I service. They're out there, I'm sure, but I haven't seen them. There's some super high traffic PWAs, but like how does, you know, how does the API work? how much of the traffic is diminished. Theoretically, you should, you should be able to handle more traffic with a PWA than you would be able to without a PWA. Um, but that's theory. I haven't seen it in person, right? I've seen PWAs with moderate amounts of traffic and it seems to be handling it really well. Um, but you, know, you can still overwhelm API resources and things like that. So it you know, would require some testing. And really the big question is, is do they feel like they need to get better to capture those sales? Or are they doing a pretty good job of capturing those sales already? And if they are, then it, it just may not be worth the risk at this point. And early adoption is a problem. Like there, there's just more risk in it right now being early. So it's, it's a risk reward kind of balance. You know, if you get a huge reward from improving mobile, it may be worth the risk um, that comes with, a, you know, being a fairly early adopter. Um, but if there's not the huge reward, then the risk is not worth it. Uh, will AMP and PWA work combined? Um, I would think so. Um, I think there's possibility to do that. Um, you know, it's, I think right now, people who are doing PWA and AMP, the AMP pages are not PWA. Like, I think, I think I've seen an example of this, and the AMP page was not PWA. Like, AMP is accelerated mobile pages for Google. Um, it's not the most popular or successful Google initiative, but it, it basically allows Google to take your mobile optimized page, cache it, and serve it to a user really quickly. So it doesn't hit your site. It's like a Caddick stash page. You know, they store it. 
they show it real quick. And then if they click off, then they go to your site and they see something different. Um, so theoretically, it's possible. Um, I don't think they will do a JavaScript-based page in AMP. So I think you'll have to do a little wizardry, a little work yourself to make those AMP pages work. But I think it's possible. Um, are there any limitations of Magento PWA? There's limitations to everything. I mean, the limitations are, the great thing about Magento is the only limitation of Magento is your ability. That's, that's the limit, right? Like it's an open source piece of software. You could do just about anything you want to do with it. You can throw it against 8,000 servers and try to serve, you know, billions of pages. Like you, you can get crazy with it if you want to. How deep are your pockets? What are your capabilities? Um, you know, Magento PWA is open source. You'll be able to get it. You'll be able to modify it. You you know, I'm sure there's some limit somewhere, but you can always throw more money and resources at it. Um, so, you know, as long as you've got money and you're really good at developing, you're there, you tell me where the limits are because you, you can push it pretty far. Um, with the, and I'm running a little bit late here, so I'm gonna try to speed this up. With the rise of PWA, will Magento deprecate the default front end architecture in the future? Some, someday, I think that's a long time in the future because I think it's still useful, right? Like, I don't think that's anything to worry about. Like, I, we're talking, you may be talking about years and years and years and years and years, like a decade plus. At some point, it makes no sense if the entire internet is PWA to have that thing. But I don't have any concern recommending a traditional theme to a customer right now because they will have rebuilt their site twice before Magento deprecates the traditional front end theme. Hi, uh, TJ. Like before you continue, let me just uh, sorry to interrupt. Like we'll have uh, like ten more minutes and just answer the questions because a small tweak in our schedule will not hurt, I guess. Okay. You can take ten Great. more minutes. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let's see. How do notifications at PWA is supported by Magento? It's not really supported by Magento. Um, right now, I'm sure there's probably some plugins you could use. You could use, you know, their services. I think Dot Digital has some notifications, a little bit more on the pricey side, but I'm sure there are other um, options for notifications. Traditionally, your notifications, if you're doing enterprise e-commerce, are going to come from your ESP, from your, your email provider. Um, and so, um, you're, you're going to use a dot digital or was a Clavio or somebody like that. Um, if you're going to try to do notifications, right. Um, the, the default notifications out of Magento are barely sufficient. If you're going to be doing, if you're serious about e-commerce, if you're just getting started fine, I'm sure they'll build in some notifications at some point, but if you're trying to do push notifications or text messaging people or something like that, choose a, an enterprise email provider, um, service provider that, that does something like that. Um, is PWA for making website responsive on mobile? Which extension is marketplace is best for Magento to PWA? Well, I mean, it's not for making it responsive. You can do it responsive without PWA. It's, it's, you know, it's taking your theming to the next level. It is lazy loading in images. So they don't, they don't slow down the page load. Um, it is caching all of your, um, assets on the browser side, well, not all, but a lot of your assets on the browser side that are used commonly across every, every page. It is about an experience when a user moves from one page to another. If the header didn't change, the header doesn't reload. It's not the old, like if you go on a website now and you click to another page, your screen goes white and you got, you know, you wait for it to load and there it is. And then, you know, PWA, you don't have that. The header stays, you click to the next page, that header can stay. And then it just loads in the content on that page real quick from an API. And then you've got that data. So next time they come back to that page, you can show that page even faster because you didn't have to hit the server for it. Um, it's about, it can live on your phone. You know, you can add it to the home screen. So it's just like a, a native app. If, you know, if people choose to do that, you can ask for push notifications. You can ask for underlying hardware like cameras or the gyroscope, or you could just do all sorts of crazy things. Do, does that then what you're displaying need to be responsive? Yes, but you, so you, you want to do responsive with PWA. You don't have to have PWA to do responsive. Um, and which extension in the marketplace is best for Magento to PWA? Again, depends on your need. Magento, it's not an extension marketplace, you know, in the marketplace. Magento has PWA Studio. Go check that out. It's React-based from Magento. 
a lot of functionality there. They're still adding functionality. It is a separate project from Magento on separate release cycles. So they're adding new stuff in there all the time. There's also third-party tools like Deity, View Storefront, if you prefer something in View. Deity's React Base, I believe. Um, so lots of options out there if you want to go dabble in Magento PWA. As a Magento developer, do I need to pull up my socks and start learning React, JS, PWA Studio to survive as a Magento dev? If you're a front-end developer, yes. If you're a front-end developer, if you do front-end work, theming work on Magento, then it would be in your best interest to start learning these JavaScript-based technologies. And that's not Magento. If you're a front-end developer on WordPress or any other platform, it is in your best interest. It's in your best career interest. Like you, if you know, your company decides a year from now, two years from now to start doing PWA, well, if you've already been dabbling, if you're already the guy, then you're a leader. You're now a leader in that organization. You can now you know, command higher salaries. You can now be the guy that is head of that initiative instead of the guy that they're dragging along. So I would absolutely, if I'm a front-end developer, be looking at React, um, Vue, you know, start dabbling in both of those because you really never know um, what, what your business is going to choose as its front end. But if you're a back-end developer, no. You know, it's, it's going to be kind of the same old, same old. And it's always good to expand your horizons if you're interested. But back-end development's not going to change a whole lot. Um, but, you know, again, good to know. All right. Service isolation, Magento's vision. I'm not sure, 100% sure I understand the, um, the question unless you're talking about kind of that microservices where, you know, we're breaking it out. I don't, I don't think Magento necessarily has a long-term vision for how they're going to isolate the services within Magento, right? It is Magento. It's an API layer. They're basically isolated by the API. So if you don't want them, you don't call that API. Uh, if you're talking about them breaking their ar architecture into microservices, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the long-term vision, but you will see some Adobe centric microservices, right? Like you've got their artificial intelligence engine, uh, Adobe Sensei, you've got, um, you know, their content management, Adobe Experience Manager. And so I'm sure you'll see a lot more of these Adobe centric microservices that are broken out, but I don't, I don't expect they're going to break Magento into different services. But if I miss, if I misunderstood that question, please clarify. Um, what is good hardware configuration for fast development of Magento at the local system? I mean, as fast as you can get it. <laughs> That's like we, when we develop here, we develop on a local machine. It's just a lot quicker than trying to develop up on the cloud somewhere. Right. So we develop locally, you push that staging uh, and then, you know, it's our development environment and then staging possibly. Uh, there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, you know, I always recommend we have the nicest machines possible. The majority of our developers are on Mac, but we do have several that, that love Windows, and Windows is a lot cheaper traditionally. Um, so, you know, you need to be able to support some sort of virtual machine, because I, I feel like that's where it's going. So whether that's Docker or some other, um, I think there's... Um, some other virtual machines that do pretty well with, with Magento as, you know, as well. But, you know, sub, look at those specs, um, support that. I don't, I don't have exact numbers off the top of my head, but as fast as possible. All right. Sounds like you're all up for PWA. Do you ever see PWA overshadowing the need to build mobile apps in the future? Yes, 100%. I think, I think mobile apps are going the way of the dodo bird for the most part. Like they're, they're going to be virtually extinct. Like you will be able to do most what you need to do on a PWA and have cross um, cross phone support. So it'll work on iPhone, it'll work on uh, Android with one technology stack. That's a huge advantage. Uh, most mobile apps don't need functionality beyond what a PWA can do. Now, you know, once once they start allowing you to distribute it in the app store, which there's still kind of some limited support around that. But once a PWA looks just like a, tra like a traditional app in the app store, then for most mobile apps, there's not a huge advantage. Now, games, resource intensive things, if you're doing some really low level system stuff, mobile apps are still going to exist. They're not gonna go completely extinct, but the vast majority of especially retail e-commerce 
mobile apps will not need to exist once the distribution and promotion of them in the app store is on par with a traditional app. Now, if they never allow you to, to market them like a traditional app, then there'll always be an advantage to having a traditional app. All right, so he is looking at service isolation. I can't copy and paste that. Um, so not sure. Um, let me see. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip down and I'll come back to that one if we have time. Looks like I'm way, way over already on this 10 minutes. Um can P okay, how is it possible to build such a web app within budget? Depends on your budget. Right? Like it's I if you're gonna if you had to go cheap, I would pick one of the third party PWAs that works out of the box with every you know piece of functionality that you have to have. You're gonna have to compromise a little bit on functionality. You know, there may be some things that Magento does that you just don't have to start off with. Um, and then that's, that's how you do it within budget. Uh, does PWA have the same impacts or benefits? Of PWA? Yes, I, actually, the funny thing is, is I think the possibilities of just adding it to your phone have huge implications for B2B much more so early on than B2C sites. And so, you know, I, I don't think most PWA implementations are not focused on B2B functionality. So Magento's PWA Studio implementation doesn't have B2B functionality at this point. So that's lagging behind. But once it's there, the, the ability to custom tailor a user experience is more important in B2B lots of times because the buyer has you know, very specific needs. They don't necessarily go through this browser journey or product discovery journey. So the ability to craft particular user experiences and have those extremely pleasant is even more so in B2B and the ability, because those customers are oftentimes repeat customers that are extremely loyal uh, to whoever they're accustomed to buying from, then I think I think PWA is going to have a bigger impact on B2B e-commerce than B2C early on until, you know, we figure out how to break outside of our own thought bubble on how to architect a site. Um, all right. So looks like we've got all of those except for the Magento architecture question. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't have a link to that. So sorry, I, I couldn't get you an answer. I think we're, way past time here. So um, if you want, just ping me on Twitter. Um, you can find me at ecommerceaholic on Twitter. Here, I, let's see. You find me on the bottom there, ecommerceaholic on Twitter. I'll get that question answered for you. And if you have any more questions, ping me on Twitter, DM me, you can find me on LinkedIn, wherever, and I'll, I'll do all I can to answer all your questions. So much, uh, TJ. It was it was an amazing session. So thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be here with us. We're looking forward to more sessions from you. Uh, thank you so much for the time you've taken and all the for answering all the questions they've posted. There are about eighteen plus questions, and it took it it really took a lot of time. Thank you for the patience too. Oh no, I appreciate you having me. Uh, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. So guys, uh, moving forward, we have. Uh, uh, Jay Kant Rajan with us. Uh, he is a product lead uh, for the product named Chloris at TCCAP. I could call him the Magento enthusiast. Uh, why? Well, he is a Magento UU uh, authorized instructor, a Magento 2 certified professional back end and front end developer. He is also a part of the Magento 2 certification advisory board. So he's been uh, instrumental in implementing various Magento storefronts and uh, developing complex Magento extensions. Jay is uh, very keen to learn new technologies and he loves to share, share his knowledge. No wonder he's here. So Jay, we'd love you to take it over. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Hey guys, uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so um, yeah. Uh, thank you for being here, and I hope uh, every one of you is uh, being safe and healthy. Uh, my name is uh, Jaikant Rajan, uh, Magento U trainer and developer, and uh, working in DCCAP uh, as a product lead. So I have been working in this product called Chloris for almost uh, two years, uh, 
Flores is a, a module bar in the cloud, uh, which actually used to integrate your ERP, CRM, and uh, e-commerce application, even Magento. Basically, it can scale to any platform. Uh, it's a pretty interesting product to work with. Anyway, uh, let's jump right into the topic. When you have a glance into the uh, Magento 2 uh, best practices guide in the official dev docs, you can find this recommendation, composition over inheritance. Let me read out this. Uh, for Magento 2 extension development, we encourage the use of object composition over class inheritance. So if you're wondering why Magento asking the extension developer to uh, prefer composition over inheritance, uh, it's not only Magento which recommends it. It's a general uh, object-oriented programming principle, which is uh, recommended and followed in uh, many uh, frameworks like Magento and uh, like libraries too, like React, etc. And uh, both uh, the composition and the inheritance are used to achieve the polymorphic behavior and the code reusability. But uh, why really the composition is preferred over inheritance? So to understand this better, let's explore uh, the inheritance first. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of you know what is inheritance is. Inheritance is one of the uh, core OOP concept and uh, it is a mechanism of deriving one class from the other class, basically the uh, parent-child relationship. And let's see an example with this. So I'm a big Marvel fan, so I love all the characters so like Iron Man, Spider-Man, Hulk, everyone. So I am planning to use these characters for this example. And let's start with the Iron Man. So let's create a class Iron Man with properties of uh, a special ability is the uh, AI that he is using, the Jarvis, sometimes Friday. And uh, he is responsible for saving the world. And let's bring one more superhero here, Spider-Man. And with that, he has the uh, special ability of uh, providing the web. And then he's also responsible for saving the world. And then let's add uh, one more superhero, Hulk. And uh, he's, uh, he can smash everything and uh, he's also responsible for saving the world. So we have uh, three different classes and uh, three different uh, special abilities, but all are responsible for saving the world, which is of uh, code duplication. So, um, and then this guy comes in, Nick Fury. So he unites everyone and he forms a team called Avengers and uh, he moved the responsibility of all these individual classes into the parent class. Let's say, uh, removing from here and creating a new class, Avengers, and moving the save uh, to the parent class. So let's bring the inheritance here and uh, let all the superhero classes extend the Avengers and just like this. And now the save will be accessible by all the child classes. So using inheritance, we have achieved the code reusability here. In the similar way, let's uh, design the Marvel villain characters. So let's have uh, the villains class and then the motto of the villain will be uh, to destroy. So let's have the uh, destroy method. And then let's bring a few villains from the Marvel. I like Thanos, so let's have Thanos. And uh, he has stones and uh, let's get Loki and he has Tesseract. So uh, we have initially designed the superheroes and villains in the Marvel and uh, assume we have launched few movies and uh, it has been successful. And uh, suddenly the Avengers Endgame directors approach you and ask for the enhanced version of Iron Man, the uh, Mark 85, which was the last version. So which can also have the ability to hold the stones from which has the Thanos. So now, uh, but you don't need the method destroy because he is going to save the world with uh, using the stones. So you need to have save and one of the uh, method Jarvis or Friday and the stones, but not the destroy. So both are different hierarchy, different classes, uh, different structure. So how do we do it? So uh, Thanos is a property, uh, sorry, stones is a property of Thanos. So we need to get it here. We cannot able to extend here in the Iron Man. If we extend, we also get the destroy method. So we have two approaches here. One, we can duplicate the stones method and we can keep it wherever uh, we need it, but it ends up in code duplication. So uh, not a good behavior. Let's move on to the other approach. 
So here let's create one more uh, parent class normal and keep the stones method there and uh, let the Avengers and villains extends Marvel and now these stones will be available to all the child classes. So now Iron Man can access stones and even Thanos can access stones. But problem with this design is it makes the object heavy because stones is not needed for all the other classes. It makes those objects heavy. And uh, even uh, Loki should not have access to these stones. If he have these stones, he might have uh, different ideas with the stones. That will be a, a different problem. Uh, anyway, uh, changing the whole design in a later point of time is a long process. And inheritance, uh, summarizing this, inheritance expects you to design everything up front and having changes at the later point of time uh, make things very difficult. So uh, we have to predict everything and we have to design up front. So solving this, we have composition here and that's why we are uh, moving to composition. So composition is the uh, ability of combining the multiple objects into complex object. And it is a way of containing the classes uh, uh, with, which has the desired functionality. So basically, uh, instead of uh, inheriting, we can inject things. So let's repeat the same classes, whatever we designed so far, or the Marvel characters, and uh, we can use composition now. And let's create the uh, class special powers and keep all the special powers here. Other, or else you can uh, create uh, individual classes for every special power CC, or you can grow based on different uh, methodology. That's totally up to you and totally up to the requirement. For now, I'm keeping everything in the same class and actions class, which has the action like save and destroy. So now you can build any um, yeah, superhero. If it can be Iron Man or Spider-Man or Iron Man Mark 85. So you have to inject these special powers and action. So we are not inheriting, we are injecting and you can use only the needed methods. You don't have to call everything. So uh, if you notice here, it makes it uh, loosely coupled whereas the inheritance uh, makes it tightly coupled. And I hope you understand how composition addresses the problems uh, arised when using inheritance. And that is why Magento and a lot of other frameworks like uh, React and stuff or preferring composition over inheritance. And uh, in Magento 2, we also have dependency injection. So which has many subtopics like preference, plugins, type, and virtual type for creating the objects. I'm not going much depth into it. Um, this uh, dependency injection will be used to create the object. All we have to do is we have to inject the uh, dependency class and that will create an object. Basically the uh, Magento object manager is responsible for creating an object for you and uh, yeah. but still uh, being a, a Magento module developer or extension developer for now we, there are many classes we migrated from inheritance like helpers or plugins everything we inject things and uh, there are few classes still like uh, controllers models still we are inheriting some core parent class for example if you want to create some controller you have to extend Magento framework app action action class only then uh, it has the ability of being a controller. So, but uh, over time things will change. Uh, this PR will be uh, a one good example. So, so uh, this PR uh, makes it the controllers as removing the inheritance from the controller. And all we have to do is instead of extending, uh, we have to inject the, sorry, implement the interface, which has been already meshed to 2.4 develop and uh, Hopefully it will be uh, released in 2.4 version. So yeah, um, being a, a Magento module developer, so uh, if you have noticed from the Magento one, we have a heavily dependent on the inheritance stuff. But in Magento 2, since we have the ability to use composition, which is loosely coupled, we can use the composition, which makes our code easy to maintain and also for the updates. It also uh, makes it easy for creating the mock objects, which will be used in uh, testing. And yeah, so uh, I believe the Magento and the whole community is moving towards this uh, composition over inheritance principle. So uh, when you're developing some module and uh, if you have some kind of uh, code reusability or the polymorphic behavior, so uh, 
instead of using inheritance better uh, use composition as per the recommendation once again uh, thank you very much and let me know if you have any questions guys if you have any questions you can use the q and a tab and post the question so that jay would be able to answer your question uh, i don't think there is any question so far yeah, i'll just get some uh, discussions on the uh, chat going on saying it was very nice session uh, so i guess uh, if you don't have any questions uh, jay so okay. we'll it, it, i think we'll be winding up in a, in in like 5 minutes or something so if there's anything we'll probably look into it and i'll let you know if there are questions Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of questions uh, which has been missed uh, in a lot of other things. Uh, Jay, when we inherited action class, we have to implement some functionalities. Abstract action does right. When we inherit an action class, we have to implement some functionalities. Abstract action does. So it is similar to the abstract class, but the abstract class uh, we are migrating from it. We are not using the abstract now. So we are basically uh, using the interfaces like uh, depends on the uh, service contracts, the interfaces. So it's good to use the implement instead of uh, using the extends. All right. Uh, is composition same term used for dependency injection? It's kind of. It's not uh, entirely. So composition is basically uh, containing uh, as per. Uh, the screen which i have shared uh, basically in the old days we used to say uh, is a relationship and as a relationship if the uh, class depends on other class using the is a relationship it will be uh, the inheritance if it is as a uh, thing and it will be composition so dependency injection is kind of as because we are not inheriting we are injecting things so the uh, caller class has the dependency to the other class and that's one if we use widget block how we can use composition so yeah there are a lot of things like widgets or and models still we have to use uh, inheritance but i'm sure magento will find a way over time and uh, all we have to do is we have to uh, implement the interface and we'll start using uh, the ability of widgets or uh, blocks or even uh, the models all right jay so i think uh, there are pretty pretty uh, questions that's it so fine thank you so much uh, for joining us so thank you so much for the session it was really really uh, uh, interesting to uh, bring in the characters from marvel so thank you so much for coming up with a concept like that so it was very interesting so we look forward to a lot of ses uh, sessions like this um, thank you for joining us this evening thank you jenny <laughs> thank you everyone thank you so um yeah so uh, thank you for coming in shrija so i was about to invite you for, to uh, discuss a few words with him over to you okay uh, hi guys uh, i hope like everyone had a great session and uh, we have our uh, polling uh, on the screen so where you can feed your uh, live um, i mean the feedback for this session so that will help us to give you the exciting more sessions in the upcoming months um uh, i would like to sh show a sneak preview of the speakers for our next uh, magento master visual series so that's going to be our uh, fourth session i would say series i would say uh, probably i would like to share my screen like where you can see our uh, lined up speaker for the next session so we are very excited to uh, announce our this, uh, speakers for the magento uh, magento master visual series uh, fourth series uh so we have jesse retsma like uh, he's a founder of hero and he is in 3x magento master and is very um, uh, i mean known person in the uh, user groups and training of magento community and um, so he'll be uh, known giving a session on playing with uh, graphql and we have an another uh, speaker for the session and he is also a participant for this session and thank you so much miladi for attending our session and uh, we are looking forward to hear you for our next session and uh, uh, muladi is an iqube founder and a president and he have 20 years of experience in e-commerce and he is a cto for several startups in indonesia and he will be addressing on understanding e-commerce in southeast asia 
and why localized platform is very, very important. So I'm much excited about this session and uh, probably like we will get back to you along with the recorded session and the link for the registration soon. And also I would like to grab this opportunity to tell about our community like uh, so what is all about DC cap and what is our line of products. So um, no, like, uh, and we are a community, uh, we are contributing to Magento as well as the whole e-commerce fraternity. So our DG, uh, DC Cap is a digital commerce agency specializing in building e-commerce friends for clients abroad. We specialize in Magento, Shopify, and e-commerce. Also with over 15 years of experience in the industry, uh, we have developed a handful of products that allows brands and businesses to unleash their full potential. So jumping into the uh, into our product suite includes uh, Productimize, uh, which is our product customization platform, and Chloris, an automated integration tool between ERP, CRM, and uh, e-commerce stores. And we have FlexiPim, your product information management platform, and a QA Touch, a smart test management platform. So that said, and looking forward to uh, hosting an another insightful session for you all. So we'll be in touch and uh, see you, bye-bye. Thank you, Shrija, thank you for that. So I think uh, we've come to the end of the session right now. So uh, this quarantine has been coming to an end for quite a few places right now. So they are getting back to normal, trying to get back to normal at least. So um, I'm really happy that technology is taking over and we, we are able to get uh, such uh, eminent speakers with us for the series. Uh, so this has been the third uh, series like Shrija mentioned. So we, we are looking forward to host more like this. Um, thank you so much guys for, uh, for being so uh, inquisitive about learning about Magento. So uh, we'll meet you again in the next uh, series. We'll keep you posted about it. And uh, I, do, I did see uh, a few posts about uh, the videos of the session. So we will be posting the videos in uh, DC Caps YouTube channel. So you can get it from there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.